mostly demonstrated in language, where the, the person who uh, kind of has the cognitive structure or architecture in their head and is trying to communicate it to the other person doesn't realise how much the other person doesn't know and is incapable of compensating for that. I think I have the curse of knowledge for you um, because here I've assumed that you have this compendic kind of structure in your head of the literature. Um, and the ability to go and seek the exact right uh, findings to apply to each of the parts of the law that are relevant in the case and that may not be a fair assumption. <laughs> so today I'm going to hopefully give you some practice at actually uh, applying psychological theory to evidence so that you get an idea of the actual steps in the process. And then um, I'm going to talk about how I'm going to be marking the assessment in quite a bit of detail so that you know exactly what you need to put in where and how it's structured. Because you wouldn't have written one of these before. This is quite an unusual thing. It's not a crack report. It's not an essay so much. Um, it's really uh, quite different from that. So um, that's the plan. And then we also need to talk a little bit about the, um, the button case, um, which is the one that um, I've been hoping we get to because there's a lot in it that I think you know we should talk about and, and work through together. So that's the plan for today. Um, so hopefully you've remembered you've got two pieces of assessment. The most immediate one is this first one which is the case review and application assessment. So I've made it a pretty short assessment and in hindsight that's probably really nasty and mean too but part of the reason for doing making it short is that I really want you to be very focused and concise in your presentation of, of both the evidence and also the psychological literature that you're applying to the evidence. So um, I think we often teach people throughout undergraduate to be um, inappropriately verbose um, in actual fact, when you're communicating scientific literature, you need to be concise and also extremely clear whilst not distorting the true essence of the, of the findings that, that you're trying to apply. And in expert writing expert evidence, rep evidence reports as well, that, that's a real skill in being able to realise that the people that are going to be reading that, that report are not, do not have a degree in psychology. They do not know what an effect size is. They do not know what an experimental methodology is. They do not know the difference between a standard deviation of the mean and a standard error of the mean. They do not know what a condition is. None of those things 
they have um, sometimes you know, natural uh, everyday language use kind of meetings, but, but the specialised knowledge that, that comes with a psychology degree, you know, that's not something you can assume. So you have to get good at actually translating these research findings into um, common parlance. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to get you to focus on doing in, the, in this uh, context. So those are the two pieces of assessment. This one's only due at, at the end of the, um, uh, towards the end of the uh, semester. So you've actually got a fair bit of time. Um, so you put, can put that on the back burner for now. Um, it's, it's more substantial uh, in terms of probably the amount of time it's going to take you to do um, because the questions are obviously a little bit more in depth. Um, and I will give you some more guidance on you know, how to actually do it along with... I'll give you some example expert reports. Um, there are some examples in the um, APA Amicus Curie briefs that I've linked to. So you should actually get on to the APA website and have a look at an Amicus Curie brief to get a sense of the way that um, they're written. So that'll give you a sense of the style in which they're written and the way, the level of detail that you have to go into in summarising um, the research as well. It's a really good way of doing that. Um, and really, thankfully, the APA also have on their website um, a, a recording of a hearing um, in Missouri for an eyewitness case. So you can click on that link and you can actually watch an amicus curiae hearing so you can see all of the judges sitting there and then you can hear the prosecution and the defence um, and then the amicus curiae part, which is uh, a person from... Uh, who's, who's basically there to help the court understand the evidence in the trial using their expert knowledge. So we don't have a, a similar kind of mechanism here in Australia as far as expert, expert testimony goes. But we do, we do actually feed into the legal system in a few different ways. So one of them is by uh, actually providing an expert evidence guide. So there's an expert evidence guide in the Bar Smith Library. Um, it's published by Thompson Reuters and myself and some colleagues, we wrote a chapter in there on hearing and the perception of sound. Um, that chapter kind of goes through um, so I wrote a bit on the cognitive psychology of hearing and perception of sound. It goes through a, a broad overview of the topic area written for lawyers, so written for, and judges as well, written for people who are sitting there who have a particular evidential matter that they're considering and they need to work out what sort of expert do I need to consult in this matter. Do I need an acoustician? Do I need an acoustic engineer? Do I need an audiologist? Do I need a psychologist? What sort of person do I need? And what are the kinds of things that they might be able to tell me about in relation to interpreting this evidence? So that, that's one way that expert evidence kind of makes it into the legal process. There are other ways as well. So um, particular sides will retain an expert and they that means that they have a particular part of the case that they're running where they need an expert to interpret probably scientific or technical detail um, of relevance to the case. <coughs> but there are some instances where people are called in um, to kind of counter an opposing expert. And there's been a lot of debate in the legal kind of realm about whether it's a good thing to actually have opposing experts battling it out in court, or whether that can end up confusing a jury and, and causing all sorts of problems. One of my colleagues um, at the University of New South Wales, Richard Kemp, testified in a case a couple of years ago now that was the first time I'd seen um, a, a psychology professor trained, who, and we're all trained in statistics and probability, critiquing another discipline areas work. So using the knowledge of, of probability theory and, and statistics to actually critique how a forensic anthropologist had presented 
um, evidence in a trial. So um, I don't know whether Rachel Searston, who's going to come and talk to you about forensic evidence, whether she's going to cover that. Um, we haven't really had an in-detail chat about exactly what she's going to talk about. Um, but I mean, hopefully she'll probably give you a, a good overview of, of how expert evidence works and, and some of the issues with it. So, I mean, this expert evidence report is really meant to be more of the kind um, that isn't about a retained side. It's really a friend of the court type of approach that I'd like you to take. So that you're trying to educate the decision maker about resolving this particular legal issue or question. That might be, you know, was this eyewitness reliable? Was this uh, forensic examiner unbiased? Uh, was um, you know this interview conducted fairly? Was this confession evidence obtained fairly? So any of those topics that we've kind of looked at so far, you can you can apply to um, to this particular assessment. Um, I guess another thing to clarify, in looking at the literature, it is implicit that you don't use literature that isn't of a high quality. Now, I'm assuming that in your undergraduate degree, you've developed an understanding of what we mean by the quality of scientific evidence. Now, that might be an unfair assumption, so let me clarify it here. When we're talking about high quality empirical evidence, we're talking about usually lots and lots of randomised controlled trials or experiments. So I, if you can find a meta-analysis that summarises a particular finding or effect and that shows that that effect is robust across many different types of studies and stimulus materials and everything else, that's higher quality evidence than a single study. But of course we know that there aren't that many meta-analyses out there. They're, they're being conducted all the time, but um, there's some instances where you cannot find a meta-analysis or you may have found a study or a, a published paper that has four or five experiments in it that repeatedly demonstrate an effect. And that's a, that's a really good uh, source of information, but you may not be able to find a meta-analysis. So I'm not going to, because I know the literature pretty damn well, I'm not going to mark you down if you cannot find a meta-analysis, so don't kill yourself trying to find one, right? Because it might not be there. Um, but I will worry a little bit if you've maybe got a paper that is, is a correlational study that doesn't really demonstrate an effect, but rather maybe just a, a, you know, a correlation between variables. Um, or you know, it's a small sample size. You would hope that the published literature doesn't contain low quality studies, but I'm a reviewer for lo a lot of these journals and I know that it does. I always say reject that the other reviewers don't always. <laughs> really, I'm not that mean. But that peer review process is actually meant to be a filter, but I have seen papers published that um, that probably shouldn't have been published or maybe there should have been another study to replicate an effect. So I just um, reviewed a paper last night actually on, um, on eyewitness, eyewitness identification looking at response time and confidence um, and that was an example of a really high quality paper because they had a really large empirical study coupled with a field study. So this massive big um, uh, police database of cases where they looked at the response time of, of the eyewitnesses and, and its relationship to identification accuracy. So you won't always find a meta-analysis, but sometimes you can find um, really nice um, empirical demonstrations of things. So do people know which, which kind of journals you should be looking at for this type of research? So the big ones in this area are um, the JEP Applied, the Journal of Experimental Psychology Applied, has a lot of eyewitnessy type stuff. The Journal uh, Law and Human Behaviour is another one. 
You might find a little bit of stuff in a Psychonomic Bulletin and Review. Um, Psychological Science also publishes um, some eyewitness stuff. There's another journal called the Journal of Applied Research in Memory and Cognition, JARMAC. Um, oh, what else is there? Those are the ones that I review for. There's public psychology, public policy and law. Or, and I mean, that won't have as many empirical articles, but it will have um, articles that kind of uh, take up a legal issue and they'll discuss uh, psychological research that's you know relevant to policy in that area. Um, so you might find a little bit there. Oh, that one uh, Psychology, public policy and law. I think it's called it's an APA journal. Um, so I mean that's that's a bit of a start, and there are some really excellent book chapters that are review chapters, um, particularly in the area of eyewitness memory, false confessions. There's entire books on that, um, and they can be really great starting points for your for your literature search. But you know, for this case review and application, you're not expected to go and spend ten years, you know, researching every single paper on a topic. Really, all I want you to do is take a couple of papers um, and just apply them to to the evidence. Now, I mean, later on, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the expert evidence report in more detail later on, um, and we'll go through the rubric for this assessment. But before we do all of that, I just want to get to the, um, the a bit of practice that I want to give you. So. One of the really tricky things in applying psychological research to evidence or to, to facts in a case is being able to actually understand you know, what exactly was the timeline of events that occurred. And often um, you, know, you might read an appeal case and it's got a reasonable kind of layout of, um, of the facts you know, in a single paragraph, but then you go on to read on and it's a much more complicated kind of process after that. Um, so in the, in the Eastman case, the first case that we looked at, the timeline was extraordinarily complicated in that case because you had, you had the initial shooting, then you had all of these different eyewitness accounts, some of them from before the shooting, some of them from um, con contemporaneous with it, and then you had appeals, and then you had the inquiry as well, which then uncovered different kinds of potential timelines for the events. So it can be really challenging to try to piece back together exactly what the timeline was. Um, but I think a really good thing to do is actually just to draw it out on a bit of paper, and that's what I do. So I get all of the information that I can out of that initial description of the facts in the case. I just draw out a timeline and just the key events onto that timeline, you know, just in order of um, recency. Um, and then, so you've got, once you've worked out, okay, what, in what order do we think this, these events occurred, then you sort of have to go, okay, what is it about the evidence, which parts of the evidence are difficult according to what we know about, for example, how memory or cognition works. So for example, again going back to the Eastman case, we know that um, they interviewed one of the eyewitnesses after the event and they had him try to make several identification decisions. I think it was maybe three, I can't quite remember now, but it was several identification decisions and then the last decision, the actual decision was only made on that last one. So we know that that there were several attempts made to try to get a positive identification um, of Eastman. And we can at least infer that in the course of doing that, there's been feedback given to the, to the eyewitness, at least in, in the way of asking them to come back in and do it again. It had to happen that way. Um, similarly, in the Bromley case, which um, you know, we, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, the, the order of events is kind of a little bit difficult to work out because you've got Bromley's order account of what happened and then you've got 
the prosecution's account of what happened. And they don't line up. So Bromley says that he wasn't anywhere near the Torrance River at a you know, certain time. He was in a bar and he was involved in an altercation there and he had, his, uh, had $60 stolen from him. He, that's the story that he told to the police initially. And then when re-interviewed later on, he changed that story. So it's exceedingly difficult to kind of piece back together you know, what the actual true event was. Um, and that's not an expectation that I have of you being able to do that because, in fact, that's what a juror is trying to do. They're trying to work out what that true timeline was. But the important thing is to know that at some point they've, the police have engaged with that, that defendant and they've engaged with witnesses. So you need to know how they did that. So when did they do that and how did they do that? And as much as possible, try to work it out from, from what's in the cases. It's not an easy thing to do. I'm not at all um, you know, underestimating the difficulty of that. So I mean, once you've got that kind of, of those key things that you can see that map, that jump out at you really is problematic. So it might be, look, they kept, they kept um, the person in, in custody for five hours um, without any kind of legal representative. Or they didn't record the interview, or they did record it and it sounds as though the person is complying with what's being said to them. So they're, try they're making up facts that are inconsistent with actually what happened. Once you've got that kind of thing, it jumps out at you as, hang on, this could be a problem. That's when you can then go, oh, I know what I can apply to this particular case. So the question then is, are there any procedures that map onto a problematic or known source of error? So the key things that you'd look at there are things like, did they conduct a line-up in, in, in an unfair way? Was it a show-up? We know there's problems with show-ups, potentially. Were there multiple identification attempts and the first three of them were failed? Do we know that at the time that the suspect was interviewed that they were under the influence of drugs or that they were mentally ill? Um, we know there's, there's issues with that. Um, what do we know about the actual encoding conditions of the witnesses that, that were uh, interviewed at, at the time of the event? So in the, again, coming to the, um, the Western Australian case, the um, Beamish case, that witness's testimony about where she was sitting and in relation to observing the offender in the shop front. Um, you know, what do we know about the amount of time that she had to observe that person? What do we know about the distance that that we can that she would have observed from? What do we know about obscuring the hairline? You know, there are so many things that you could pick out. And that, that's the other thing, there's no right answer with this assessment in terms of what you decide to pick out. I really am looking for you to just go exploring. I want you to really think about the possibilities and go, okay, I'm going to focus on this because I know there's, there's findings in this area that are consistently showing that um, you know, that viewing distance is a, is a difficulty. Or I'm, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. When I first read the assignment, yeah. it to me into, like, in search of the types of evidence. Yeah. It's been in categories like um, what we're doing. Right? Yeah, yes. Oh. Like, um, like <laughs> so you're thinking you can't do, oh. Or oh, one eyewitness and one forensic or, you know, racial profiling of it. No, no, no. You could narrow take, down. yeah, narrow down, <laughs> yeah, because otherwise, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise that's what you thought. Yeah. Oh. And no wonder you were like, why, why are we not doing forensics until we're five? Yeah. This is due now. Because oh, I couldn't work out what that issue was there. Yeah. No, so you could take, for example, you could take, um, you could even just do like 
eyewitness identification evidence mm -hmm. and you could slice that into things that would have affected um, the viewing conditions. What do we know about viewing conditions? And then you could go things about the procedure, so system versus operator variable, uh, system versus, what are they called? Gary Wells, tell me. <laughs> you know, there's two separate um, types of variables. There's things that the police can control and things that they can't. So you could even like divide it up that way. So I, I don't expect you to cover like whole categories of evidence. Oh my God, you could never do that yeah. in 800 <laughs> words. <Yeah. laughs> no, no. <laughs> And for those of you who have actually managed to do that, yeah. that's amazing. Can we talk about <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you, yeah, so um, the question here was, can, yeah, the question here was, can you talk about how, for example, um, jurors have interpreted, yeah, it is. And that's what was confusing. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. No, you can, you can. So, they, I mean, you could say, I'm going to look at, um, the fact that uh, they've given probability mm. related to DNA, and there's a whole literature on, on the issue of how people interpret probabilities. So I'd love to see you know people look into that. That would be great. But I mean, I'm not going to mark it like I'm expecting this really. Um, there's only like three types of evidence that you could possibly select. Uh, what I really want to see is um, how you go about applying. The literature that you find, yeah. So as long as Absolutely, yeah. That's the important thing. Yeah, the, it's the it's the justification. All these mental breakdowns. I know for nothing. <laughs> oh. So then, uh, when, we, when you mentioned, for example, that's not something we in class. And oh please, yes. This is the idea. Yes, go forth and research. This is honours. You need to. So, like, I'm, yeah, so this is how I do what I do, right? I, I am inspired all the time in my own research group to look at these different um, effects as cases present themselves because there are so many interesting real-world things that happen that we have, from a scientific perspective, we have very little idea about. Or we may have a good idea about, but the courts have no idea about so that, I mean, that's what I want, want you to do. I want you to go explore and use your finely honed literature reviewing skills um, to get out there and have a look at what has been, um, what's been done on this. And I mean, that's, that's the other part of it. When I come to the criteria, I'll sort of flesh that out a bit more. But this mapping onto, mapping onto the particular problematic or known sources of the error, that, that's like, the really hard bit, but it's also the really interesting bit. So, um, you know, you might say that, um, for example, an identification made by a child has a particular type of set of problems associated with it. So if you look into that literature, you're probably going to find that the main issue with children is they choose too easily. What is it that, that we know about this particular case that means that the child might have been trying to choose someone from the lineup to satisfy demands placed on them. What are some pot potential dangers in that? Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Sorry. So just the sort of same idea of how it's sort of structured. So if you use like the Eastman case, for example, so if you're talking about, if you want to talk about conditions, or if you want to talk about the way that um, like Reed identified um, Eastman, mm. would you prefer that we maybe sort of focus heavily on, say, like the conditions like the conditions of viewing or to sort of say like here's a few of the problems in it and just quickly talk about it or is it better to sort of flesh out one like you know um you know the uh say it was you know um like the multiple failed attempts and yeah just really focus on that and not really talk about maybe like you know yeah I, conditions yeah i think that it's really general um kind of motherhood mm. sort of approaches that you often read in book chapters about yeah. eyewitness identification are not really that valuable. Yeah. So I think the second one. Yeah. So multiple identifications. So for Eastman, if we were if we were using Eastman, we would say that that's a problem from a couple of different perspectives. So there is there are some papers, I know there are papers that have been that have actually looked at multiple identifications and what happens over multiple identifications to witnesses um, decisions. 
Um, so, I mean, you'd look at that and you'd go, okay, this is a possible issue. Or you might say, okay, um, if someone has failed in an identification and now asked people to do it again, could that be interpreted by the witness as a form of feedback? And then what does the literature say about if you give them disconfirming feedback, um, what they might end up doing? So, in applying the findings, what you want you want to go for more, um, you know, not yeah, narrowly focused, and that will also help with the word count because there's no way you could cover like, all of the um, uh, not estimated variables that could have an effect on an identification, uh, sorry, the encoding of, of an event. So if you were to go through and say, um, go start talking about distance, time in view, lighting, um, the level of arousal that the, the witness had at the time, you know, all of those different things, you blow out your word count about two seconds late, you'd never, you'd never even get to talking, answering the second part of it. So, um, so, I mean, the second bit is really, what does this research say about this impact? So there I'm looking for you to actually really clearly say to me as a pretend like I'm a judge and I don't know anything. You nearly really need to say to me, what do you think the impact of that particular factor was on the reliability of this evidence or on the, the reliability of the decision that's been made here? or a judgment that's been made. Um, so what were we going to do? We were going to try and do look at Bromley. So let's look at Bromley, and we'll do this as we look at Bromley. So Bromley's a local case um, from the 1980s, and um, we're just going to focus on the evidence of the taxi driver, Mr George, who was uh, an eyewitness who was, who was called uh, and interviewed in this case. So this is um, the evidence of the taxi driver. Michael George, a taxi driver, gave evidence that on the night of the 4th of April, he'd driven four men, three of whom were Aboriginals and one of whom was white, to the western end of Hindley Street, where he dropped them and had seen the men walking off in the direction of West Terrace. That was in the general direction of the spot on the riverbank where the alleged murder, alleged murder occurred. Bromley, Carp, Punny and Carter um, were Aboriginals and... Um, I think you say this Dosa. I think that's how you say the victim's name. And I apologise if I've gotten that wrong. Dosa was white. From photographs, George identified Dosa as the white man who he had, whom he had driven that night and Bromley as one of the Aboriginal passengers. So that's that's the that's all you get about the identification evidence. You just know that it was a, a photo identification um, procedure that was used, not a live procedure. Um, it was not suggested in argument before us that there was any reason to doubt the accuracy of the identification which George made of Dozer, but the accuracy of, of his identification of Bromley was strongly disputed. Evidence was given by the police that Bromley had been seen running away and hiding in some bushes. Bromley, in his unsworn statement, explained this by saying that he panicked because he'd only the day before been released from jail on parole and he'd just been involved in a fight. So this is kind of two identifications. The taxi driver described the Aboriginal man from whom he identified as Bromley as very smartly dressed, light coloured suit, white tie, black shirt and hat, unusually in fact very well dressed. It's kind of giving a reason for why he would have remembered it, which is interesting. This description did not correspond with other evidence, including that given by police officers, as to the appearance of Bromley that night. In the course of the summing up, the learned trial judge said that George seemed to have been mistaken about what clothing Bromley was wearing if it was he who got into the car, and added that George might have mistaken the colour of the jacket in the light as it was in Hindley Street. After counsel had raised the matter, the Leonard Child judge rejected, uh, redirected the jury. So, um, I mean, a lot of appeal cases have, a re have appeal on the basis of the, jury, the instructions given to the jury in summing up. Um, so this is the excerpt of the redirection that the judge gave. To avoid a misunderstanding, I'll remind you that if you think that the witness George might be right, that the man who got into the taxi was wearing a white suit and white trousers, black shirt and tie, and a hat with a brim, it must be a reasonable possibility the man who got into the taxi could not be Bromley. That was the, the direction that he gave about that evidence. 
The discrepancy between the evidence of George and that of the other witnesses as to the clothing worn by Bromley was clearly brought to the mind of the jury. It had not been shown either that the learned trial judge committed any error of principle or that the trial was carried in this respect. So this is obviously taken from a, um, the appeal case and it is the judge's opinion here that this redirection was enough to uh, deal with the issue of the, a potentially mistaken piece of identification evidence being let into the trial. So many, many things in here that we could look at. I can think of at least five. You've got a cross-race identification. You've got potentially poor lighting conditions. You've got inconsistency in the witness's descriptions of the person that they saw and no independent verifiable evidence about which of those descriptions was correct or not. So, I mean, those are all things that... So there's a literature regarding um, witnesses' inconsistencies and the types of inconsistencies that can be indicative of global accuracy in memory and whether or not small inconsistencies even relate to overall memory accuracy. So there's a literature there. There's a whole literature on cross-race identifications. Um, so those are two things that you, know, you could look at in relation to this trial. There's a, uh, a little bit of a literature on, and in fact a paper was just published last week by uh, one of my colleagues, Ryan Fitzgerald from Portsmouth University. It's just published on looking at the difference between a live versus an identification, a photo identification parade. Um, previously, as I understand it, the courts have always preferred live identification over photo identification, but this study has shown that there's very little difference in terms of its ability to, to actually um, produce uh, accurate evidence, which is really interesting. So any, any of those things could be possible things that you could talk about um, and that you could have used in terms of applying the literature. Um, so, um, oh, and the other thing, of course, if you read a little bit more of the Bromley trial, is that the, one of the witnesses, the main witness, in fact, um, who was um, one of the three people described. Uh, so the main witness was um, Carter. Is that right? I think. Yep. Yes, yep. Carter. So Carter was identified as having schizoaffective disorder. So, the, I mean, a lot of the expert evidence in this trial was about the memory ability of people with um, sch schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders. So, um, and indeed the appeal that was launched later on was about that expert evidence and whether or not it was problematic. So there's that, that aspect of it, mental illness and memory. How does mental illness affect um, the accuracy of a memory? or memory reports, and how do psychoactive drugs affect memory. Whole big literature there. And there's also this issue of uh, cross-race identification. So I've just put out a couple of papers, one by Chris Meissner and, and um, uh, I guess John Brigham. They did a meta-analysis back in 2001, so it's a bit, a bit old, but um, it's a pretty good meta-analysis nonetheless in terms of the size. And they've shown that there is, a, there is a reduction in discriminability in signal detection terms when identification is cross, work, cross versus, um, sorry, not cross versus, I thought it was meant to be cross versus own race. Other. Cross versus other, that would, that's just silly. So that's meant to say own. Fix that now. Own race. Um, so... This reduction in discriminability, you could argue, is a potential for uh, an uh, inaccurate identification decision, um, an ina inaccurate identification of Bromley. So George is a white person, Bromley's an Aboriginal person. Um, the issue of mental illness and memory, this 
paper by Bora Ucell and Pantelis um, shows that there is significant impairment of working memory, long-term memory and short-term recall in schizoaffective disorder compared to other mood disorders. So not just compared, not compared to normally functioning people, age matched and matched on everything else, but compared to other types of mental illnesses. Um, and that was a, again, that was a meta-analysis um, on that one. So you could argue that there is a not negligible probability that, um, that the, the memory capacity of a person with schizoaffective disorder, and remember this was a person experiencing hallucinations at the time, could have been impaired. Now, by how much is what the judge will ask and what, you know, what the prosecution might ask if you were under cross-examination. And as an expert, you can say, we don't know. You can only give information about the relative effects on the basis of the, the scientific evidence that you have. You can't give an exact application to the specific case or circumstances of a case. And I mean, that can be really frustrating for a lot of um, legal representatives who want to wheel in an expert who's willing to say 26%. But the reality is, this is normative data. So on average, there's a significant impairment of working memory, long-term and short-term recall and schizoaffective disorder, on average. So there's a distribution of effects that could be as, and you can look in the paper, and, that, and that's one really great thing about um, using better analyses in particular, is you can get a um, confidence intervals around an effect size. So you can say it could be as small as this or as big as this, but it's an effect. It could be a really major effect or it could be a relatively minor effect, but it's an effect. So any questions about, about that? Yes? In terms of the detail about that? No, not at all. I wouldn't because you just don't know. Um, I doubt they would have run a, a back in 1984, they would have run a sequential procedure because the first sequential paper was only published around that time and I'm pretty sure the police aren't subscribers to the JAP, but who, I might be wrong, who knows? Um, certainly when some procedures are, are advocated for, they get widely advocated for across jurisdictions and international boundaries. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speculate. I'd try to go as much on the, the facts of the cases laid out in the trial, which can be frustrating because, yeah, it's, yeah, it'd be much more fruitful to be able to go, oh, that's how they did that procedure. And, I mean, one of my colleagues, um, one of my PhD students, actually, who she did her PhD on I was interviewing is now working in police intelligence in SACOL. And um, <laughs> her partner is a detective. And he, he actually uh, came along with us to a conference um, in Canada a couple of years ago and he loved it. He thought it was the most fantastic conference. And I was like, you can come to every conference. Because he's like, oh, you know, this, I didn't realise this was a thing. And he was learning so much. And I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for allowing people to come who are actual practitioners to conferences like that um, and encouraging it. But... Um, when we got back, he gave me the the old training video for, and I should bring it in actually, um, for SAPOL on how to conduct a, an identification parade. Um, I should bring in some so you can see. It, I don't think it's the way that they do it anymore, and I haven't had a chance to catch up with uh, with Colin and Libby to find out um, if I can get a. I was really trying to get it foot in the door over at SAPOL to just get them to show me how they do an ID parade. But yeah, close, they're pretty close to shop. <laughs> um, and that's fair enough, I mean, yeah, they've got to really trust that I'm not going to start critiquing their processes immediately and go to the other tribe and <laughs> I'd be persona non grata. But um, I think, yeah, maybe don't speculate 
um, on what it might have been. Um, all you know is it was a photo parade. Probably most likely simultaneous. And that's a bit about it. That's a good one. One thing I'm quite interested in reading some of these cases is um, there's especially evidence I think in Eastman where um, you have a prosecution uh, who's very like focused on one individual. Um, they might even bring in witnesses that are very like almost. There's also almost an implication that they're working for the prosecution, right? They're not really. You know, they're not really... They're not of, impartial. They're not impartial. And like, you sort of get that feeling. I don't know if that's a bit of a rabbit hole to figure out or if it's... Well, looking at. in terms of the psychological kind of theory or effect or, you know, partiality, um, I don't know that anyone... I can't think of anyone who's actually looked at that. It's more of a legal mm. question. So, um, in, in procedure, if a witness is... Um, so, every witness has to be cross-examined and you have to have the opportunity to cross-examine, both sides have to have the opportunity to cross-examine the other side's witness. You can have a witness declared hostile if they're not answering questions completely truthfully and effectively. And a judge can, can direct a witness to actually answer um, a question. Um, but in terms of, I don't know what you do really to... Uh, to apply a finding that would allow you to, to detect partiality. I don't even know. I'm not even sure how you, yeah, so how like you play that. Bias or study bias yeah. Or well, I mean, yeah. There's been um, there's been a whole heap of studies, hasn't there? I mean, there's um, the the study that um, I talked about with you last that one of my other students did, Meg Feeney, did last year, where she looked at early um, leanings towards prosecution and offence and the presentation order of particular types of evidence and how that can impact. That's, that's a kind of a broader question about, you know, order of evidence and process. What I'm sort of wanting you to do is drill down a little bit more into the actual evidence itself. So rather than legal procedures or trial procedures or, um, you know, even jury instructions, um, look at look at the actual evidence that was put forward and what might be the problems with that particular evidence, either in the way that it was elicited or expressed or obtained or how you know how did it get into the trial in terms of you know, did the police use the right procedures to avoid memory contamination? Did they use the right approach to avoid a false confession? Um, or is there evidence to the contrary? You've got some really great materials in the false confession area, particularly from Saul Kasson, who's been doing this research for ages, like 30 or 40 years now, that show uh, what the features of a likely false confession are in terms of the way that a witness expresses themselves, but also in terms of the factors that are likely to produce false confessions. So it is really worthwhile. Um, I mean, false confession is not so much an issue with the um, Drummond case, but the it, it, in your other expert evidence case, you might think about, uh, or assessment, you might think about um, that kind of literature too. Yeah. Some of it's more la better, better laid out than others. Like some of the research is really systematic. Um, like most of the eyewitness research, eyewitness identification research is really systematic. I'd say the eyewitness testimony research and stuff on interviewing is not as systematic as it could be. Um, but I think that's just a function of the way that over time the research has evolved and people have gotten involved at different points. Um, okay. So, oh, and the other thing that you could look at in the, in the Bromley case is the effects of intoxication from drugs or alcohol. So it was um, suggested that the people involved had all been drinking and um, there's also the other possibility that upon seeing someone being bashed to death, <laughs> you might experience a bit of stress. And there's a whole literature on stress, trauma, threat, what happens to people's attention when they're experiencing a, when they're witnessing a crime that's quite violent. So there's this thing called the Easterbrook hypothesis. It's thought that people's attention narrows 
and they can really focus on central things, but the peripheral information kind of isn't encoded as well. So um, there's a whole bunch of literature on, on stress, trauma and threat in relation to, to memory and the operation of memory. What's the name of that hypothesis? Sorry. I think it's called the Easter Book Hypothesis. Is the book? Yeah. Um, it's been studied way back in the 1990s. <laughs> Not that long ago. <laughs> Apparently the 90s are cool again. <laughs> Get my wicked dark lipstick and my, my purple jumpers. Yeah. My um, Doc Martens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was when I was at uni in the 90s. So that's, yeah. That's a bit of a pointer. Um, so I wanted to talk about the button case today. John Button, we're going to power through because I've got this thing from the airport tonight. So I'm going to drive home in the back again. Yes. Yes. It's on. Yeah. Um, the button case was is a really, really well-known case in Australia because it was probably the first major wrongful uh, conviction case. I'm pretty sure. Like there were some earlier ones um, that were identified as part of a uh, English um, review of identification evidence way back, the Devlin report. But this one really, I think, is incredibly interesting. I, I hadn't read it for a while and then I went back this week and started reading it again and um, I'm reading through the original trial and I'm thinking if I was a juror in this case I would have convicted this guy as well. It was so compelling. It was absolutely compelling the evidence that was against John Button and I'm sure there are people who still believe that he's guilty. And that, in fact, you know, he should never have been uh, exonerated. Um, and it, you know, there's other cases like this as well, where you look at it and just like, oh, is this really a wrongful conviction case? Um, but then you start reading about all the evidence that wasn't tendered, and then you start realizing, wow, it is amazing how long things can go when one hypothesis is pursued doggedly and the other one is never considered. So the appellant, uh, so this again, taken from the appeal case, John Button was charged on an indictment dated 2nd of April 1963 and on the 10th of February 1963 he willfully, that he willfully murdered Rosemary Margaret Anderson. Um, after a trial on the 29th of April to the 4th of May 1963, he was convicted of the offence of manslaughter, not murder. Um, there was an issue there, I think, with intent that wasn't met. And um, sentenced to imprisonment for 10 years. An application to the Court of Criminal Appeal for an extension of time within which to appeal against his conviction was heard in uh, 1964 and dismissed fairly rapidly. And then an application for special leave to appeal to the High Court of Australia was refused in 1964. So by that time, I think it was expected that that would be the end of it, really. Um, but <laughs> along comes the confessions of a convicted serial murderer, Eric Edgar Cook. So pretty horrific guy, um, not the kind of person you'd ever want to meet in person, I think. Um, he confessed to being the, uh, the driver of the car. He wrote out a confession uh, and, and had it signed and witnessed. Um, so I think, I can't remember whether it was written as an affidavit or not. I think there's some dispute about whether or not it was witnessed properly and written properly in terms of you know the legal requirement for it being an actual confession, because that's really, remember, really heavily codified in law, um, which 
So he said he confessed to saying uh, and said that he was the driver of a car which struck him Sanderson and killed on the night of the 9th of February 1963. And he gave a very detailed account of, of what he did, which is horrible to read. Let's be real about it. So, I mean, when you read through the cases, as I said before, it seems really, really compelling. But then you start to look at the things that um, were later uncovered. It wasn't just the confession evidence, I think, that was... Uh, critical in having the conviction overturned, it was also the evidence of an expert who reconstructed the actual um, accident. So they got a guy in from the United States who um, was an expert in uh, motor vehicle accident reconstruction and he did a whole series of kind of tests using the same make and model of car, um, both the car that was alleged to have struck uh, Rosemary Anderson and then the, the car that Edgar Cook said that he used as well and used an anatomically kind of uh, for height, weight and everything else uh, hu meant to be human form dummy that they use in these kinds of accident reconstructions did a whole bunch of tests and basically showed that the um, position of the of her body and her belongings and everything else that couldn't and the damage on the car um, on Button's car was not consistent with him having struck her. So that was the other key aspect of the evidence that led to the conviction being overturned. Um, and of course showed that the other uh, that the account given by uh, Cook was uh, actually really, really accurate. Um, like within you know, it, the position of where she was, where she would have been, and you know, the damage to the car, everything was really accurate. So, the fact, the big thing that got John Button convicted, I think, in the first place was the fact that he confessed. So, he, he confessed to having killed her. Um, and in this instance, I think a key kind of set of research is this research that's been done by Saul Casson. And there's several studies, but these ones are probably the two key ones. So in these studies, Kassen, so the first study by Kassen and Norwick published back in 2003 um, was investigating when it is that people waive their right to remain silent. Now, Miranda rights are uh, an American thing. Um, and so it's a, it's a very American like it's very much contextualised within the American legal system. But um, here in Australia, it's my understanding that you also don't have to answer any questions that are put to you. So you do have that opportunity to wait until you have legal counsel with you before you say anything about anything, basically. You don't have to say anything or do anything. So, um, I mean, it does have relevance here. Uh, so one thing that Carson found was that if a person or a participant in this study believed that they were innocent and had a high degree of trust in the um, kind of system, they were more likely to waive their rights um, even when there was a clear hostile intent from the detective investigators and there was a risk of interrogation that was apparent to them as well. So people who believe that they're truly innocent are more likely to waive their right to, be, to not say anything. So you're already set up to fail kind of by that fact. Um, the second study that's relevant is that investigators put more pressure on to suspects when they operate on the presumption of guilt. So if you say to an investigator, look, this person, do this, then they, they approach their job logically and they think, well, my, my um, job then is to extract a confession and also they will interpret relatively uh, neutral behaviours or nervous behaviours as being indications of guilt. None of these, neither of these studies are overly surprising, but what they do highlight is the, um, the conditions under which false confessions are kind of set up to occur. 
Now, there are probably more, significantly more um, aspects to the button case that you could go into and sort of look at and, you know, how long was he held for, what kind of mental state was he in. He'd just been told that um, his girlfriend had been had died in hospital because he'd, he'd uh, taken her to, to a doctor and then they rushed her off to hospital, so he just found that out. So what kind of mental state was he in? And was it reasonable to actually present him with a, a statement of confession and get him to sign it when he was in that psychological state. Um, so that's that's kind of how how that goes. Um, so the last thing we're not going to go all the way through. I've, I've, so this is really just the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll let you interrogate me <laughs> um, as much as you want about this assignment until you feel happy about everything that you've got to do. Is the marking rubric so? This is the marking rubric, and um, I use a qualitative rubric, so I won't give you a number. I'll just write on your assessment what I think of the, what you've said in relation to that criteria or, or point. So first thing is, does your report clearly identify two aspects of the evidence that are given in the trial? Um, so have you actually picked things that were in the trial? <laughs> and not made them up. <laughs> so that's why I said, don't infer, try to go on what's in front of you as much as you can. And I've said aspects of evidence. So you could say, I'm gonna take um, two, like identification evidence and confession evidence, or whatever evidence. You could, or you could take one piece of the, of the important evidence and interrogate two aspects of it. It's up to you, and I think, given the amount of time you've got, you might want to limit it down. But to be honest, I'm just really looking forward to see what, seeing what you come up with. I think it'll be really, really fun to mark, which is not something I never say those words, <laughs> but I'm saying them now. The second criteria is: Are there clear links between the identified problem with the evidence and the psychological literature? So, have you actually found? the literature that says that this is a problem and is it clear that it actually maps onto that evidence? So, and this can be as simple as, like you've said, I don't know, um, it was a cross-race identification when actually there's no cross-race identification in there. Um, so, I really want you to be able to say that it definitely, there definitely is a problem with this evidence because a study by Casson and blah, 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 or a study by blah, 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 found that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and have you accurately um, and clearly explained those findings from that literature? So don't go beyond the findings and try to extrapolate out and say, for example, um, you know, that this effective perception on, I don't know, vision could mean that this this witness was wrong because they had a, I don't know, like don't go, don't stretch the the boundaries too far. I'd I'd like to see that you've got this really clear finding and that it's described really accurately from the original paper that you haven't actually inferred or you know generalised beyond that particular finding. Next one is, is it clear how the operation of the effect finding or theoretical assertion, because I'm, you know, I'm not expecting that there will be a theory necessarily, um, and I'm saying effect finding because oh, there should be an effect. It should be the case that there's an empirically demonstrated effect. Um, sometimes people just call them findings, but it, it just has to be the conclusion of the study, the, the result in that study. So if you look at um, level of detail, so, uh, go back up to, here we go. So if we look at the Bromley case, this is the level that I'm trying to get you to. So it's a cross-race identification. 
This study found that there was a reduction in discriminability when the identification is cross versus own race. That's a dis dis description of the, the effect of the cross race on people's ability to discriminate face. So, and with this one, significant impairment of working memory long term, short term, and recall in schizoaffective disorder. Now, of most relevance here is recall in the long term because that's like over a long period of time. If you look at this paper, um, what you'll see is they've used a lot of standardised psychometric tests. So they haven't actually measured episodic recall in a, in a kind of eyewitnessy way. They haven't shown people an event and then gotten them to recount the event and then scored it according to a, you know, a coding scheme. So this one's a little bit more of a stretch, but it's not, too, it's not too far. It's the best I could find, and I found this in about 10 minutes. Not even five minutes. This was a Google search. <laughs> so I had, this is not like, I reckon there'd be made of much better studies out there um, if you'd spend a bit more time looking for them. Yes? I'd note the limitations because I don't want you to just be in this constant hung up state of not knowing whether there's another yeah, study out there or just about to be published that was the best study. Um, I will absolutely reward effort <laughs> in that regard. You, like a five minute Google search is probably not enough. <laughs> but if you, you, you know how to search the literature really well, because I know you knew that because you would have heard from um, uh, you know, the expert search librarian on how to do that. So, and you've been doing it already as well for the last three years, so you, I'm pretty confident you're going to be able to find um, studies that are much more relevant than I ever would be able to find. Um, so that's the level of detail. Um, where were we up to? Up, ah, this bit. So is it clear... Because remember, in the original question, we're asking about how this effect would have misled and caused a problem for the fact finder. So is it clear how the operation of this effect um, might have misled the decision maker? So in this instance, if you, know, if you had eyewitness testimony and the witness had been given feedback, that makes them much more confident than they should be. So it's quite clear that a confident witness is going to be more convincing to a fact finder. Or um, the, the other decision making you could think about would be uh, the, the, the police. So maybe they have been too confident in their getting a, a confession out of someone. Um, or a judge. If it was a judge only trial, because they're not all jury trials. Um, so if you've said that this evidence is problematic because it, because it may be an error and this error would lead you to think that this is more reliable than it should be. If you, that's basically meeting that criteria, that you've demonstrated that. And then I'm just looking for your appropriate references, so it's APA referencing, and then have you written in a clear and concise way. And I know all of you can do that. That's like a gimme, that one. Tick. Unless you write, you know, in some kind of drunken stupor or with no sleep for 10 hours, 10 years. That's what I feel like at the moment. But the, um, the clear and concise writing, that'll help me as well when I'm reading through them. But I'm really excited to read them. I'm so looking forward to it. Um, because I love this stuff, <laughs> and I hope it's I hope it's fun at least to do this type of assessment. And I know it's challenging, so I will absolutely bear in mind that this is the first time you've done anything like this. So I'm not going to be like a real asshole and just go, oh, "This is terrible. What are you thinking?" Because I yeah, I really want you to do well. So. Are there any more questions about the marking rubric or the approach to the assessment? People feeling, yep. Abstract. Oh, no, don't, don't waste time with abstracts. It really is just, um, 
as far as formatting goes, it's really just a concise report. It's it's not meant to be a, you know, like, oh God, you know, abstracts. What are we training you people for? To write freaking abstracts? <laughs> I can't write a decent abstract. I'm terrible at it. I'm, Probably shouldn't say that out loud, but I should get another author to do it. <laughs> hey, writing for stress. Yeah. Um, for two edits that really look fine, mm. um, can I use a psychological theory to apply that to um, to um, to say why this happened? Yeah. Yeah. Why because the problem of this decision and that decision and that decision. Yeah. And that just, yeah, so just be careful with theory because theory, there's theory and there's theory, right? Mm -hmm. So there's really broad, like, verbal theories that are very broadly stated and are actually redescriptions of an effect. Mm -hmm. And then there's theories that actually have mechanisms in them that state how something happens. Mm -hmm. So in choosing a theory, what you want to do is you want to go for one that actually tells you how it is that, for example, a person became more confident than they should be about their identification decision or a person um, misattributed their memory for one thing, for, for one item uh, when it was actually another or, you know, misinformation stuff. So if it's a theory, that's great, but make sure it's the right one. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, so it's been a while since so, in terms of what it would look like, I mean, I've expected, we've got limited work now, so we expect to sort of have a quick feel about this is a report about this case and these are a quick facts, or is it just straight into like this um, evidence, that evidence? Yeah, I think you're going to run out of word count if you give too much more than like a two sentence context for the report. Um, I know people often want to do like a really nice introduction sort of thing and but I reckon you'll run it you might run out of word count and um, that would be a shame to to you know get not do the meaty part which is really um, you know this this bit here and I have given that out redescribing you've given away word count by redescribing the assignment for me which I know I know what the assignment is because I've said it so so we just have like basically two titles like Evans A yeah, yeah, you could do it that way. Yep, that'd be fine. Yep. Yes. Um, do we need to be in a discussion about the actual case? Like, um, so, yeah, in, case? I, I wouldn't give a case somewhere because you would, you would chew up all your yeah. word count. I assume that I know the case, assume that I can look it up. And so, how many times have you assigned to say, never assume your marker knows what you're talking <laughs> about because they can't. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Yeah, I know. Isn't it terrible? We teach you all the wrong stuff and then you get, get you into honours and say, just forget all that. <laughs> no, it is very frustrating. Um, but the, the reality is that, you know, in honours, I keep saying this, but you, you guys are actually, um, you have some good degree of expertise now. So, and you're being expected to write for people who have real expertise. So there is some assumption there. Even in your thesis, I mean, this is a bit of free advice, but... Um, you're going to be examined by people who know a quite a lot about your topic. Um, now, why that means you shouldn't you shouldn't absolutely just launch straight into you know the nitty gritty. You do have to give a bit of context, and we do care about being led along by the nose a little bit in, in your writing. Um, you're also writing for an expert expert audience, so so it is different. It's like um, I Stephen Pinker describes it as. Um, the uh, thinking about the audience as uh, the um, oh, what does he call them? The intelligent um, other sort of thing. He's got a word for it. I can't remember what it is. But he, he's basically saying that think about your audience like they're at a similar level, but they don't know exactly what it is that you that you're trying to convince them of. Because it, it's a persuasive piece of writing too, in a, in a way. It's about, the thesis is about uh, developing an argument for why your piece of research should be done, showing how it was done, 
to answer to you know answer the questions that you need, you've convinced us that you need to answer, and then you know going on and describing uh, what the results are and the implications are for these findings that you have. So it's it's really it's really different to what you would have done before in undergraduate or you know in any other type of writing that you've done. In that it is a an educated, intelligent audience that's on that's specialist psychology people. So they know they know what things are. Yes. Um, yeah, you could have a, a little brief summary, but I wouldn't restate. I can't really, I don't think it's necessary to restate everything over again. It could be just, in conclusion, the key psychological findings that apply to this case were blah and blah, and they may have led the, misled the blind this way. Full stop. Yes. So like writing like a short answer. It really is, yes, yeah, it really is. Yeah, that's kind of the equivalent, yeah. I'm sorry I can't give you an example one because this is the first time we've run it. <laughs> so I could probably, would it, would it help if I wrote one on one of the cases and then popped it up? I'll do that in the weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's not a lot of time is there, but um, I'll try and get that done. I should be able to get it done. Maybe not tonight, but... Um, try and get it done tomorrow. I think I've got a bit of time tomorrow. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh yes, it does. Yes. Um, and yeah. Yes, so um, they call it Blue Book, and it's really crappy because their Blue Book um, referencing is, I think it's called Blue Book, is really fine if it's an American case. <laughs> but um, I'll, put, I'll put it on, I'm, I'm not going to ping you for getting it wrong because it really is hard to kind of work out which bit goes where, but I'll put an example on, on my example. Yeah. Okay. Then you'll be able to see it. Oh, just the legal, how do you reference a legal case yeah. in APA format? It's in the APA. Oh. Yeah. It'll be online too. Um, let's find it. Why isn't Chrome the default browser? Do you know, I've written lots of papers where I've had to reference legal stuff. And um, I wonder if this will work. Probably in the search there. Uh, it will. Our oh, university search is useless. Uh, I want a Google search. Um, Yeah, I, I've incorrectly referenced this in the wrong format. Ah, oh, here's a star blog. That's blah. Where's APA 6? That would do. CSU. In-text citation is like that. Won't be statutes. Um, in the references, it's like this. Uh, that's all American. That's not going to be very useful. Let's see if we can how good Google is. Oh. 
Southern Cross University comes to the fore. So, in text citation, that's Acts. I don't want Acts. I want case law. Oh, cases. Here we go. Title of case and year. And then it, it, it references. There you go. It's just like that. So it's button against R or whatever it is. And then the year. And this, these little numbers here, if we go to Ostley, um, and search This is this is the bit here that you'd put in after the brackets after the year. Western Australian Supreme Court of Appeal. Yeah. So that goes in like that there. And then the number is uh, yeah, thirty five. There you go. Yeah, each, each one has a separate... Um, so if you look down here, um, it'll list all of the relevant... Oh, it's got legislation. No, no, just list the one that you've used. So... I think they're all... Are they all in the... the total reading. If you go through the whole thing, I'm pretty sure every appeal... Yeah, so you need to just reference the one that's relevant to the... the like the quote. Yeah, the, the extract that you're using. So say you didn't use any extracts and you were just having an intro sentence saying this was the case you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Which reference would you... Which number would you then use? You'd use the, the primary yeah, one. Yeah, original. Okay. And then you still your references? Yeah. I'm not going to ping you for like incorrect letters. <laughs> you don't that believe that. me. <laughs> a law professor might, but not this one. Because <laughs> I'm psychology, so. Yeah. And then, and then you do comma, then like you take square brackets, I think, for the paragraphs. Like specific. Oh, if it's, quotes. yeah, specific, like actual quote, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, that's well, simply. Hang on. Haven't I made it? Oh, God. oh, that might be because. So, Rachel is coming to talk to us, not next week. But the week after, and she hasn't given me. I've suggested some cases to her, but we haven't confirmed them yet. So I'll put them up as soon as she's okay with them. Oh, uh, they are up there under one, two, the button case, I think. Oh, oh God! I keep doing that. I'm so sorry. I don't. Does it? Oh, uh, here. Freaking, oh, that's so annoying. I keep doing that all the time. Oh. <laughs> so this is the one that, um, these ones Rachel will be talking about. Um, so I've just got to confirm with her this week about, no, uh, sorry, yeah, tomorrow, that she's happy to do them. So I'll just make sure of that before I publish them. She might be like, no, I wasn't going to talk about that. And then the final one that we have is with um, uh, an actual law professor, um, and he's going to get back to me on the the content a little bit more decision in the future. I'm sorry to not be able like completely 
organized. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Example scientific jargon, Carlos. I wouldn't call that jargon. Um, I wouldn't call that a very useful statement. <laughs> but uh, it's not untrue. Um, I think the way to think about it is that you're wanting to explain to me you know, what what the effect is that's irrelevant. So describe the effect. And then you're wanting to say this is this is important because and then you're relating it to the actual facts of the case. So I'm like I guess you gotta think in a balanced way about each of the criteria that I've given you. So if you can read back through your assessment with each of those criteria and you can honestly say, I have done that, yep, I've done that, ooh, I'm not sure if I've done that. If you get that feeling of I'm not sure if I've done that, then you might you might look at it again and say, okay, I'm gonna change it around a bit. So worrying about things like word count, um, precise use of the right terminology down to nitty gritty, that's less of a concern than, than the conceptual demonstration of the criteria and the answering the question. Just answer the question. If you answer the questions, then you'll be totally fine. And you shouldn't have an issue at all with it. But of course, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, and I'm sure you will spam me with questions in the next week. Because as you do it, you'll, you'll be like, I don't know about this. Should we post questions on the discussion board as opposed to email? Yeah, you can do that. That might be handy. Um, I think I said before that um, if you've got yeah a question that you think would be valuable for everyone else to, to learn from, then yeah, please do use the discussion board. Oh, did you? Oh, you haven't been on there. Hang on, let me see. Yeah, you can be on there. Have I been? Oh, see, I'm absolutely delirious. Where are we? That one? Oh yeah, look, I answered those questions. Look, Brittany asks all these useful questions here. Are we allowed 10% over 700 word limit? Yes. Uh, is there a marking rubric? Yes, there is now. <laughs> uh, there's no minimum number of references to use. There's no maximum either. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Please, <laughs> please don't take that seriously. Um, it's fine to use subheadings. Uh, if, if that helps you to organise your thinking, I know some people, uh, for some people subheadings are, are useful. Don't put an abstract in. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, wow, is there more? Oh, okay, so Bart's asked here, I said, never fear. <laughs> um, so I think I'm answered. Mention rubric, yeah, done that. Okay, so yeah, post up there, that's probably useful. Um, but you know, if it's of a, you need to ask for an extension or personal type stuff, then obviously don't put that on the discussion board. Just email me. All happy? Feeling better about it? Good. Go read stuff. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. Um, the grace period. Oh my god. It's so bizarre. It's like a.